And because of that book, I put down my prescription pad and I never started patient on medications again. And I dedicated my practice to what's now called deprescribing and became um, really experienced <laughs> in what that process looks like for patients sometimes who've been on, you know, four or five medications for, you know, quarter of a century. <laughs> and I learned the natural history of this deprescribing process because I never restarted anybody on medication. So I got to see like really the, um, the potentially very ugly, actually scary dimensions of what it is to come off of what I now have come to believe are the most habit forming chemicals, you know, on this plane. Kelly Brogan, MD, is a holistic psychiatrist, author of the New York Times bestselling book, A Mind of Your Own, and Own Yourself. She completed her psychiatric training and fellowship at NYU Medical Center after graduating from Cornell University Medical College and has a Bachelor of Science from MIT in Systems Neuroscience. Kelly has faced intense censorship and smear campaigns for speaking out against the medico-pharmaceutical industry and was wide awake to the COVID fraud early on in 2020. She has transformed the lives of thousands of people by helping them stop psychiatric medications and through her online healing programs. Kelly is one of the world's best advocates of terrain theory in the way she models health and well-being. Kelly Brogan, I am so excited to have you on the channel with me. It is very, very overdue. Thank you. Oh, it's such, such a delight to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> cool. Well, I'd like to start for the audience that haven't heard of you. <laughs> Most of my audience will definitely know about you, but I'd love to start with your background. So going back in time, and you were working as a psychiatrist, specializing in prescribing meds for uh, women that were breastfeeding and pregnant women. Is it is that right? Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? Yes. So I think I incarnated to try on some very uh, contrasting polarities in this lifetime. So I've really, I've really gone deep into um, these very different mindsets. And I became a practitioner, let's say, of scientism. When I was, I went to school at MIT for college and there was a suicide hotline that for whatever reason I chose to volunteer at and uh, called Nightline. And I was really um, inspired, honestly, by my experience there and this sense that we have cracked the code of human suffering. And all we have to do is match up these people who are having a hard time with psychiatrists at the mental health center and they have the magic potions and everything's going to be okay. And in retrospect, of course, especially now that I have taken um, a very deep dive into my own inner work and exploring the way that trauma reverberates like throughout our adult persona, I look back and I, and I really consider the possibility that I had such little tolerance and capacity to hold in my bodily system, another's discomfort that I needed to find the solution, right? So not the solution to like, what happens when your blood sugar is unstable or what happened, you know, I probably could have become an emergency doctor that also would have like scratched this itch, right? But I needed to not feel in my body another person's acute struggle. And so I needed to have a solution. And psychiatry provided that for me. It provided the, here's how we're gonna fix this, AKA how I, Kelly, no longer have to feel the discomfort that your discomfort is inducing in my own body, right? So I went to medical school to become a psychiatrist and have been, uh, now I have really spent a lot of time reforming and reframing my perspective on this particular subject, but I, I had been a lifelong feminist and decided that the best expression of my mark on the world would be to specialize in helping women gain access to pharmaceutical um, you know, psychotropics. And so that's why I specialized in 
I was one of the first 300 to specialize in what is called reproductive psychiatry, which was essentially a burgeoning field to address the fact that one in four women at the time, so this is back in like 2009, one in four women were entering into their reproductive years on an antidepressant specifically, right? And when you include the other psychotropics, it's an even higher statistic. And we needed to know what to do with these women, right? It's a Sophie's choice. Should she just stop her meds and, you know, struggle with her mental illness? Or should she continue her meds? And then what? What do we know about the teratogenicity? What do we know about the the risks. And at the time that I entered the field, it was mostly pharmaceutical registry data. So that's like passively collected reports on, you know, my baby was born with an abnormal number of fingers or whatever it is. And at that point, I was pretty well convinced that these are relatively safe medications and certainly safer than the seeming alternative, which is to do nothing, maybe some talk therapy, and just sort of struggle your way through your very serious pathology. And so it wasn't until I was postpartum, my own pregnancy, after my fellowship, that I had that, you know, what's called in psychology, the rupture of empathy, I had this experience of what ultimately I, I characterized as like a betrayal um, by the medical system, because I was diagnosed with my first medical condition, routine physical, diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and had had some notable forgetfulness, like double booking patients, like forgetting my ATM pin number, things that were very atypical for me. But of course, when you're a new mom, it's all like, oh, that's new mom stuff. And, you know, I was back in my skinny jeans, like three weeks postpartum, which is very typical, you know, as you know, for a postpartum thyroiditis kind of a picture, like this kind of pendulum swing. And on a routine physical, you know, I had antibodies in the high thousands, um, TSH over 200. And it was like really shocking to be confronted with the possibility of taking a prescription for the rest of my life, right? Just like my patients. So suddenly when it was for me to embrace that felt uncomfortable and um, the dissonance of knowing that there was a better way than the way that I was really standing behind and promoting to my own patients was um, what le led me to this fork in the road, right? Where I could have dug my heels in and said, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to roll up my sleeves and walk over to CVS and take my Synthroid forever. Uh, or I could go down this like unexplored path. And that's what I chose to do. I saw a naturopath, which is highly uncharacteristic of me, of course, uh, as a believer, you know, that, that these so-called alternative um, medical models were really dangerous. Like I actually was, was taught to parrot that, uh, and irresponsible, you know, irresponsible when there is valid, uh, data to support the kind of medicine that I was Ivy league trained, you know, to, uh, purvey. And I watched my numbers come into the normal range in black and white within the space of one year. And all that I did was change my diet. And that was, you know, instead of being like so exciting, like, look, I put this potentially chronic and recidivistic illness into remission. Wow. Like, this is so cool. I was enraged, like actually um, went into this like intense window of my life where I, I just saw a fight everywhere and I took my sword out of her sheath and, uh, you know, I published uh, what ultimately would become a grassroots New York Times bestseller with an exploding pill on the cover with hundreds of references. And I intended to take down the industry that had sold me this bill of goods that told me that diet doesn't matter, that told me that you cannot put a chronic condition into full remission and what ultimately would be lasting remission. And I felt betrayed. Why? Now I understand because I had parentified this institution, right? So this to me was mommy medicine, right? And, and closely uh, associated with daddy government and, and this kind of parentified um, dynamic often flips from the idealization, compliance, obedience field into the rebellion, defiance, and, you know, the, the vilification and that's where I was for a lot of years, uh, a really angry activist. And 
I began to research all pharmaceuticals, right? So I started with psychiatric meds and I was given a book as my journey would have it called Anatomy of an Epidemic by a social worker colleague of mine. And she was like, well, what do you think of this? And I read it because of this state that I was in. Otherwise, I would have thrown it in the garbage. And I read it. And essentially, Robert Whitaker, the investigative journalist who, who penned this book, made the um, assertion that the ever escalating rates of disability, mental health disability, you know, the world over are the result of iatrogenesis, meaning that, you know, uh, for anyone who doesn't know that word, meaning that it's doctor induced harm. And he's, you know, had non-industry funded data to support that assertion. And because of that book, I put down my prescription pad and I never started a patient on medications again. And I dedicated my practice to what's now called deprescribing and became, um, really experienced in what that process looks like for patients sometimes who've been on, you know, four or five medications for, you know, quarter of a century. And I learned the natural history of this deprescribing process because I never restarted anybody on medication. So I got to see like really the, um, the potentially very ugly, actually scary dimensions of what it is to come off of what I now have come to believe are the most habit forming chemicals, you know, on this plane. And that process also initiated me into a deeper appreciation of the spiritual and um, psycho-emotional maturational journey that we're all on, you know, because in my own lived experience, I was really relating to a lot of my patients who were going through these dark nights. And, you know, I wasn't coming off of meds myself, obviously, and or not obviously, but I wasn't. And I began to study really the, the architecture of coming into adult consciousness. And what I became really fascinated by, still am to this day, is this, um, what I call the only human pathology, which is this concept of victim consciousness and how it underpins our experiences of anxiety, so-called depression, um, and really our struggles in general. And how do we initiate, you know, out of beyond victim consciousness? Like, what does that look like? And that's become really my obsession, actually, um, is to monitor myself in my own life for the signs and symptoms of victim, my own victim story and my own victim consciousness, and to really dedicate myself to reclaiming my power of choice, taking personal responsibility as you teach, you know, and, and uphold and model as well, you know, and, and what is it to um, really relate to myself on a 360 degree uh, level so that there aren't really any enemies out there, right? What is it to end the controversy, to end the war um, inside and outside? How does that look? And of course, in medicine, that looks like, you know, the resolution of germ theory, the re resolution of the chemical imbalance theory, the resolution of the, uh, you know, uh, lipid hypothesis of heart disease and the mutation theory of cancer. Victim consciousness is, is what all of allopathic medicine really is predicated upon, right? Like it's a triangulation of you against you <laughs> with the help of the rescuer who is the system. And it feels familiar because that's our childlike psychology. And ultimately, there's no winning that war. It's a zero-sum game. So this is really, I guess, what, what lands me um, here now. Can I just go back? Because a couple of points I really wanted to ask you about was what you must have had such a leap of faith to go to the naturopath. Like, did you, was it, was it a suggestion? What was kind of that trigger? Or was or there must have been some deep-seated reason for, behind that? So <laughs> I call it now, I'm very interested now, you know, as I've moved through my sort of Jungian individuation process and studied these various stages, like more recently in the past couple of years, I've been very interested in shame and specifically um, sexual shame and body shame. And I actually think, and I can say this kind of thing to you, that it's uh, an orchestrated agenda that is um, on the socially engineered level to really um, triangulate us against our own life force energy, against our biological, um, creative, 
and sexual impulses and to really begin to disconnect us from that which animates the human body, right? I, I call the process of coming back into contact with that the reclamation of eros. So when I, when I look at these kinds of questions, right, these kinds of dynamics, like why as somebody who derided and judged and dismissed you know, natural medicine, let's say, I don't even have a word for it probably at the time. How did I find myself in that seat, you know, in that woman's office? And it's because of the tension. I call it the erotic caress of the enemy. It's because of the tension that we have when we are in polarity against something, right? You can think of our colleagues who have dedicated themselves to fighting certain figures on the world stage or, you know, health freedom fighters who are fighters, right? Instead of celebrating, you know, health of the body and whatever else they're like fighting the system. And I was absolutely that person. I'm sure it sneaks out at times still, but the truth is when you do that, when that is your orientation, um, you are deriving energy from that which you are condemning, right? You're in tension, you're in dynamic, right? So I was already in dynamic as a scientist and practicing allopathic physician with that which I rejected and judged. It wasn't that I didn't have an opinion about it, I did. And so a lot of times what happens is that we, we can flip, right? And I'm a perfect example of that. I've done it dozens of times on many different topics. Uh, and you know, whether it's like diet or, you know, feminism or politics or whatever it is. And so I found myself in that place because they already had a relationship subconsciously, semi-consciously to naturopathy. It was already in my field, right? And so when I was confronted with the reality, I mean, I could have prescribed myself, you know, the Synthroid for the rest of my life. It wasn't going to be like hard or challenging to just do the compliant, obedient thing. But I knew what that model had to offer. And I knew one too many women who were my patients who never felt well after a Hashimoto's diagnosis, even when they were compliant, even when their numbers were in the reference ranges. And I didn't want that. I wanted the escape hatch. So I went to this already somehow familiar space of like, you know, the escape hatch, like what other options do I have? And I also happened to attract into my field, a woman, um, her name is Nicole Egenberger, a woman who's very erudite, very academic, very intellectual, right? So she, I didn't go into her office. There wasn't like burning sage and like mala beads. It wasn't that. Okay. It was, I was in a comfortable, familiar, like scientific realm, and I, um, I really needed to see in black and white that this was more than a theory. The truth is that I felt different weeks after taking gluten and dairy out of my diet, right? So which were the two primary interventions. I felt totally different. I mean, I had no idea what like normal physiology was because we don't learn, as you know, normal physiology, right? So like, I didn't know what my bowel movements were supposed to look like. I just thought, who cares, right? This is just, it is what it is. And so what, as my body, you know, began to align itself, I felt that this was the right path, but I still needed to see it in black and white. I still needed to see, you know, my antibodies come into so-called normal range. Um, and so I guess it was also probably, you know, spiritually ordained, you know, this is such a, a critical opportunity for me to resolve a lot of the, um, the rejection that I could have, again, doubled down on, right? Like I could have said, like, I will be doing the white coat method, right? Like I'll be doing exactly what I was trained to do. And, you know, going down this path, um, you know, I got, I got kicked off of two faculties ultimately. And, you know, it, it, it was, um, a, a, a divorce, I guess. Right. Because I chose to be extreme, in my perspective, you know, I never practiced integrative medicine, you know, like fish oil with the Prozac kind of thing. And I really wanted to get into the mentality of my body does not make mistakes, right? There is nothing to be afraid of here. And there is meaning in my story. And to get deeply into the, that mentality, me and my patients, we had to build like a fierce boundary and barrier between us and the conventional medical world. 
And I don't know that these fierce boundaries and barriers, right? Like those of you who have cut your parents out of your life at some point in your process, for example, like I think there is a time and a role as we are finding our spines, right? There's a role for that fierce no. My patients contracted with me to not interact with any other um, MDs or conventional doctors for the duration of our work together. They didn't go to the emergency room. They didn't nothing. Right. So we, we like sealed up, right. All of the, uh, all of those escape hatches. And because of that, there was, um, a container created as we mature. Right. I don't know that those fierce dogmatic rigid lines are necessary. I think it actually becomes important. And I'm learning this in my life now to get to a place where you trust yourself to make the right choice for yourself in any given moment. And you don't need to rely on these harsh rules, right? So, you know, 15 years later, I'm still really dogmatic about gluten and dairy, right? And I travel the world and I'm like really rigid about it. And I, you know, I could tell all sorts of funny stories about it. I've recorded them on my podcast, but, you know, recently I've recognized I have an opportunity to, to soften that and to see what happens when I, just trust myself to make, you know, the right decision in the right moment. Um, but at that time, those hard lines seemed an important way for me to organize myself in this nascent, you know, new um, mindset. I, I didn't know that about you. That with the uh, that's really interesting about that you had a contract with your patients so that they because I find one of the hardest things uh, for individuals when they're reaching out. For some sort of assistance in whatever area that they're trying to change is often this is that there's this kind of still this dependence on the allopathic model in some way or shape or other um what from what i'm fascinated by is your first times that you started i guess taking people off their um and, and mental health medications what was that like? Like, were you, yeah. how did you, how did you even go about this? Because it's such a, it's so opposite of everything that we were taught and, mm. um, and a real, it's, uh, you're challenging everything about your own yourself, really. So when I decided that I was angry enough <laughs> that I was going to dedicate myself to, uh, helping women who chose to, of course, uh, because I had been, I had been trained believe it or not, in the consent model. As a reproductive psychiatrist, you know, I was actually trained conventionally to sit my patients down and their family members for a two hour consultation, go over all of the available literature, the risks, the benefits, the alternatives we'd whisper about, but whatever. And so I had that in mind that consent was paramount, right? That these women, including my hundreds of pre-existing patients, had an opportunity now to either transition their care to somebody else or to go with me on this journey, should this appeal to them. Right. And so it was a whole reorganizing of my, um, in intentionality. And when I began to recruit my pre-existing awareness of how to taper a medication, all we're taught is, Oh yeah, you just take down the dose 25% a week and in a month, you know, you can stop anything. Right. Okay. So I did that. And what I, learned in very short order when I was essentially running like an outpatient medical rehab uh, was that that is not going to um, be a sustainable approach to deprescribing. Around this time, there was an Italian group, Fava et al., and they began to put out the first literature acknowledging discontinuation syndrome, as it was called, because I was taught you taper off, or let's say you forget doses of, you know, your, your Zoloft, that's called a, and then you develop symptoms, that's called a relapse. Okay. The, the, the medical literature began to speak to the fact that this is not um, the organic pathology, if you will, resurfacing. It's actually the medical withdrawal phenomenon associated with habit forming chemicals. And that really validated, it was like perfect timing, right? So in my practice, and there were, there were people who were at this, like Peter Bregan, you know, for decades before I got to the picture, but I only began to, to learn about, you know, all of these foremothers and forefathers before me, you know, as I was like in, in the trenches, right? So I, um, 
I learned the hard way that that coming off of these medications can be so physiologically destabilizing that these women required what I would imagine was like some kind of an inpatient care facility. And I was not able to offer them that because, it, you know, as far as I knew at the time, it didn't exist. So that is actually what I guess gave birth to the awareness that if I had healed myself, you know, in this way, perhaps offering this kind of, you know, anti-inflammatory, if you will, um, nutrient dense, uh, nervous system stabilizing protocol or combination of factors to my patients, maybe that could help like drain their body burden bucket before we start stressing them with the taper that I, of course I would have to engage much more slowly. And that's when I began to learn that, that people, patients had already developed an entire body of work around how to taper properly, right? Like on chat rooms and bulletin boards, people were talking about how to do it. They had like, you know, jewelers scales out and they were crushing up pills and measuring percentages. And they were doing this because they were being gaslit by a system that says, no, this is not discontinuation. This has nothing to do with medication. This is your symptoms. Meanwhile, these patients are like, you know, developing, you know, gastric bleeding and hair loss and skin, you know, lesions, and they're not sleeping for months at a time. They're having electrical shocks down their spine. You know, these are not the symptoms that they came, you know, to the mental health system in college after they broke up with their boyfriend. Okay, this is the gaslight, right? This is something we do, you know, hopefully unintentionally, uh, but it's something we do to patients all the time, right? And I remember saying, I remember being coached by an attending uh, in an inpatient psych unit to say to a patient who asked if they could come off of medication at some point after they left the, the inpatient stay. And I remember being coached to say, you know, it's kind of like eyeglasses. Once you need them, you just got to kind of wear them, right? And so that's what I believed. And so once I began to require um, my, you know, this, this protocol, this one month protocol that I put together based on my own experience, once I began to require that first, it was a, you know, a long month before we even decreased their dose 10%, that's when I began to see um, a shift in the process. And that's when I began to have not only outcomes as far as like deprescribing and graduating, you know, patients from the mental health system, period. But that's when I began to also see uh, all of these outcomes in other specialties that I know nothing about, right, or little about, right, so called rheumatology or gastroenterology, and I would have a patient with Crohn's and his Crohn's, I had one male patient, uh, actually, at the time from my residency, and the rest were women, but I remember his, his Crohn's, you know, re symptoms resolved. And that's not what we were after, right, we were tapering his effects, sir. And then I, you know, began to extrapolate the program online. And so I was able to scale and, and get more and more feedback and outcomes. And we, you know, we had resolution of chronic lupus and uh, asthma and um, infl uh, irritable bowel. And of course, different types of psychiatric diagnoses from, you know, uh, serious suicidality to actual um, schizophrenia and bipolar and OCD, eating disorders. And it just seemed like, how could it be that this one approach, right? This one template could possibly have all of these varied outcomes. And that's where I began to understand um, that we can create conditions for the body to be sent a signal of safety. And that what happens when the body is sent the signal of safety is that you can reclaim neuroception, right? Like you reclaim your capacity to actually perceive reality through a contemporary lens, right? Through the actual real time here and now lens, adult lens, right? And, and you're no longer in your fragmented trauma state from earlier in your life when you develop this relationship to your own body and your own symptoms and your own emotions. And then ultimately went on to be diagnosed and chewed up and spit out by the system. And it's where I developed this idea that the people who are captured by the medical system, but specifically the psychiatric system are, you know, canaries in the coal mine, that they are really rightly sensitive, you know, to what is actually 
wrong uh, with how we are living, right? Like how we are living out of alignment. Those of us who are the most adapted to it, you know, are, are lacking a very real human, um, you know, sensitivity and calibration and the, the sort of like square pegs in the capitalistic societal round holes tend to be those we label as um, sick. And, you know, that is an inversion, like so many inversions we're familiar with. Also, uh, what you mentioned earlier about the chemical imbalance thing, because <laughs> I remember being taught that too at medical school. Are they still, is this, if you were practicing or coming out of mainstream psychiatry now, is that still what, what would be taught? Um, that is a great question. My assumption is yes, that it is, you know, we are for, for anyone who's not familiar, although like, that's the thing, like everybody probably is. I mean, I joke with my kids who are teenagers about this, you know, when they, because sometimes they just like bust me and they're like serotonin, the happy chemical mama, you know, like, cause it's so pervasive that literally my teenagers know the word serotonin. Why, why? Right. And, you know, actually New Zealand, right. You have direct to there's direct to consumer advertising. My understanding is in the United States, Brazil, and New Zealand, and where where these companies can speak directly to consumers about their biology. <laughs> so you have these commercials about like little bubbling neurochemicals, like drifting across a receptor, and people like you know frolicking through fields and whatever. And we are conditioned by this messaging such that when you enter into your, you know, doctor's office, you have a pre-existing placebo and no SIBO effect waiting to be discharged, right? So most people have heard this idea that depression, but like probably anxiety and schizophrenia and bipolar and ADHD, like it's all like chem chemicals up there, right? Chemicals that are need a little balancing and you take the medication and it balances your chemicals out and then you're fine. But you just got to keep taking it because otherwise your chemicals are not going to be balanced, right? So this is so pervasive. I actually wonder if this or the germ theory concept is more pervasive because the, I mean, it's just like you everybody just takes the, and, and, and this includes, as is the, the case with germ theory, functional medicine, integrative medicine, and a lot of holistic medicine where they're prescribing, you know, tryptophan and amino acids to balance your happy chemicals, right? They're just doing the greenwashed version of the, your body is broken, you know, mindset of allopathic medicine. But it's been a long time since this concept is called the mono, monoamine hypothesis since that this has been abandoned by bench researchers, right? By even the medical literature itself, this discipline called psychoneuroimmunology, right? So this, this idea that all of these seemingly disparate systems are actually connected and that our thoughts impact our hormones. Um, obviously there's the concept of the immune system in there, but nonetheless, it's this idea that you know, inflammation is a response. It's a meaningful response to an environmental stimulus. And this has been in the literature for decades, but somehow we're still persisting in this medication-based model that says, you know, it's, it's like a reverse engineering that says, if this medication helps you, it's because you have a problem with the associated chemicals and the analogy that, you know, um, David Healy, who's one of the whistleblowers in this arena that he uses is like, you know, that's like saying if alcohol helps you with your anxiety, you have an alcohol imbalance, right? And it's not accounting for the fact that these medications have an effect, right? That's why some people advocate for, there's no such thing as side effects. There's just effects. All of them are effects, right? So these medications have an effect, but why is it that we are led to believe that they are correcting an imbalance? And probably the, I think one of the most important researchers in this realm is named Joanna Moncrief. And she just came out with, I mean, I think it was like just last year with this huge umbrella review of like 
tens of thousands of participants. And she looked through all of the, you know, serotonin, serotonin metabolite research, looking at, you know, concentrations in various body fluids and spinal fluid, looking at receptor and transport binders, looking at postmortem, looking at all of these different um, angles and lenses through which we could explore the, the potential relevance of serotonin. And you could, you could say this for any of these neurochemicals to mood behavior and cognition. And her conclusion was that there is no relationship. Okay. So, and she, this is not the first time she's tried to make this point, right? So she's saying there is, there's no evidence for there being an association between serotonin and depression. So my hope and expectation would be that, that this assertion would, and, and publication would change the way it is taught. But I think you and I both know in fact, I remember a study that said that it takes 17 years for scientific research to translate into clinical practice. And that's why most clinicians are practicing what is called consensus medicine, right? They're practicing like just because everybody else is doing it, medicine. And so I, I imagine that this is going to be a difficult <laughs> sacred cow, um, you know, to, to turn over because of how how dependent the entire psychopharmaceutical industry is on this monoamine chemical imbalance theory. Now, at the same time, you know, I just did a somewhat tongue in cheek, sarcastic video about how apparently, uh, you know, we're using antidepressants to, to treat um, COVID, like to actually treat it, not to treat associated anxiety or whatever, like to actually treat it. Right. So there, there may be some, you know, sort of um, evolution of the conversation around what antidepressants are doing to like include their anti-inflammatory and apparently antimicrobial, I don't know, effects. Um, maybe that is happening because the truth is we have no idea. I like actually no idea what these medications do. I mean, I actually, um, and, and many of our colleagues question whether receptors have even been identified, whether, you know, cell organelles are even what we're told they are like, what are we actually talking about? How many assumptions are these theories resting upon? And is that why they're called theories? So, you know, when you zoom out, um, this understanding that they work is, is based on this, this very baked in theory. It's also, it's based on advertising and it's also based on, you know, this, um, <laughs> a lot of the nefarious practices of industry, right? And some of which are permitted, like they are allowed pharmaceutical companies to do as many studies as they want, as long as they come up with two, you know, that, that demonstrate benefit for a medication, they can get FDA approval, right? So that's like flipping a coin as many times as you want until you get two heads and you say, look, I got heads, right? And you can hide all the rest in the file drawer. And that's why, you know, again, whistleblower Irving Kirsch is a psychologist who through FOIA requested unpublished research, you know, uh, around uh, the 12 primary antidepressants. And, you know, what he found was that the number of studies that showed positive effect or benefit from these medications was actually less than half of those that showed nothing, right? And he went on to further analyze what he calls the active placebo effect, uh, which is, you know, what happens when you control for the so-called side effects, right? So you take this medication, you get dry mouth, you get some diarrhea, and then remember all that advertising, right, kicks in. And you're like, wow, I'm in the treatment group. I knew there would be some side effects. So that means something's happening, right? And what unfolds is attributable to that active placebo effect. So what he concluded is like 88% of what we are calling medication effect is actually attributable to, to placebo. So, so that means that, you know, we are getting mostly exposure to side effects. And so that really begs the question, okay, well, what are the side effects, right? Like, what are we talking about? How, how safe or dangerous, like, are these medications actually? And that, you know, we can go into that if you want, but that, that was really, um, my research into that was really why uh, in combination with Whitaker's book, I said, I can't in good conscience ever prescribe a medication um, in this category again. Yeah. Really powerful stuff, Kelly. Um, with the, 
so with the antidepressants, um, because I, I read in a, I think an article or an interview you'd done previously, but um, I, I don't want to say it incorrectly, but it was something along the lines of antidepressants in your, like, so SDSRIs and those sorts of medications are worse and more addictive, or the coming, the withdrawing from them is worse than benzodiazepines. Was that right? Or am I, um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So, there's a lot in the media around um, opiates, you know, and when I was in inpatient setting, um, there was a lot about like heroin and like, how do you, you know, do you use methadone or buprenorphine or like, we have in our minds that there are problematic substances out there, right? Alcohol, maybe even cigarettes and, you know, crack cocaine, right? And what I, what I have observed is that there isn't, there aren't chemicals that require dose decrements on the order of like sometimes two to four or 5% of the dose per month, right? There's no, none of, none of those things I just listed. I mean, you basically go into rehab for five days and you're off the thing. For most people who have experienced deprescribing, especially after a long exposure period on the order of years or decades, this is a, um, at least a year long process. And it is attended by many complex symptoms. Now, obviously I'm describing that I, I think I found a way to, to mitigate those. Um, however, I still was able to appreciate, you know, that there's, there's nothing like these. I, um, I, I wouldn't say that. So I would say that as a class psychotropics, relative to other substance substances that are characterized as addictive are far and away more problematic to discontinue. Within the psychotropic class, there are definitely medications that I found to be way um, easier and less consequential to taper or even you know rapidly uh, discontinue. The benzodiazepines and the antidepressants I would put in the same category, however, of like, you know, this is, um, this is a life defining initiation. And that's really how I've come to characterize this process, right? Because it's really easy as somebody who is thinking about coming off of meds or frustrated by their inefficacy, maybe really just like been through the ringer, uh, you know, that's like one of my public uh, former patients, Ali Zek. I mean, that's what brought her to my office was she sort of been and done all the things, been on all the meds and nothing was helping, right? So it, whether you're that person or you just are through the window that initiated this contact with the system and now you want to see if you can get off, right? And what what you'd be like without it. Um, the, the process can either be like something that you're doing on the side of your regular life or you think it's going to be that, like, or it's this like annoying thing to deal with, like, or you can orient toward it as like, this is actually my initiation to adult consciousness. And that requires that I pick up the pieces of my soul and relate to my body in a way that is empowered, right? That is not from that childhood dependency, helplessness, and, you know, really fear, right? Powerlessness. So it is an initiation. And I have come to believe that the, the people who are called to this experience of deprescribing and meeting themselves without such medications on the other side um, really have like a very, very important sacred mission. Not that we all don't, but in, in and for the collective. And I have found that. I mean, I saw it over and over and over and over again. And I, I continue to, I mean, my, my home is filled with commissioned artwork, you know, from a woman who was supposedly, you know, left on the side of the road, bipolar on multiple meds, read my first book, did the protocol on her own. And now is like a flourishing, successful artist, you know, I mean, she reclaimed her gift and expressed it. Right. So I saw this over and over and over again, that, you know, there is um, a gift to be expressed when you align with yourself. However, that the process of getting to that place of um, really finding your feet, like after the discontinuation, it's, um, it's harrowing, right? It's harrowing. And that's why I think I 
set the container the way that I did, right? Because it's like when you do a vision quest, right? If you know that you can just come back if you're scared and hungry, <laughs> it's not going to have the effects, right? So like when you have a fierce contract and, you know, I look back, I think a lot about like, you know, gendered polarities, masculine, feminine, mother, father. And I really, I really feel like I played, uh, I haven't practiced in several years, but I really feel like I played the role of, you know, the, the spiritual father uh, to these women, which sounds weird, right? As a woman. Um, however, it was a lot, my, um, my masculine containment and my uh, gaze upon them, you know, to, to, to transmit and convey, like, I know um, you, you can do this. Like, I know you are perfect. I see your radiance. Like I see you um, in ways that you don't. And I've got you until you see yourself that way. And I, it feels like the gift that I brought um, is that I had this capacity. I could sit across from a woman in my office in New York City, and she could be, you know, on four meds, you know, bloated, joint pain, hair falling out, just at the end of her rope. And I could see like this radiant being, like I could see her um, well, you know, like, like literally, literally, literally. And so it, it, it's like, I never really bought the, like, I'm sick, I'm broken thing. And, you know, people like Ali say like that, I, I was the first person to say, there's nothing wrong with you. Right. Which sounds potentially like a gaslight in and of itself. Like, right. Well, they're sitting there and like, uh, yeah, there is actually, that's why I'm in your office. Right. But the truth is that there, there was, and is nothing wrong with any of us. And when you're indoctrinated by a system and a society, you know, that, uh, requires you believe that it's, um, it feels very vulnerable to try on some, it, it's antithesis, right. To try on something else or, or to, to think, wow, like, you know, the, 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 the wound is where the light shines through kind of a thing. Right. Or to think, um, God, it had to be this way, right. It had to be exactly this way. And, and now I'm ready, you know, now I'm ready, uh, to shed that identity and how I was getting my needs met as a patient. Right. Cause that's an important thing to understand, like how people get their needs met when they're sick. Um, and they, they imagine some subconsciously, I guess that, it's the only way that they can, right? It's like why we manipulate, right? We manipulate because we don't imagine we can ask directly for what we want. Well, you get to a certain point and you're like, oh, I have a choice here. You know, like I, I can, you know, set myself up so that I get the attention and compassion and I have the loving relationships and intimacy in my life that I need. And I can, you know, develop my capacity to hold states of contentedness and peace inside and joy and maybe then pleasure, right? I'm ready for that um, because moving in the direction of change when you're ready feels like relief. You know, that's been my experience and that's what patients describe to me. Like it feels actually like relief and it shouldn't, right? Because it should feel scary, right? It should feel just terrifying to move into this like unknown um, terrain, but it doesn't, it feels like, oh, finally. <laughs> There's lots of graphs, like I got sent one recently, the global prescribing rates of antidepressant medications. Um, so I know that the US is number one, but actually New Zealand is equal to, <laughs> to the US as well. Interesting, right? And it must have something to do with that advertising, you know, because it's the, there's only three countries. I wonder where Brazil is on that, on that scale. What do you see, how do you, what do you see as a kind of, not the solution, but a way forward? Is, is there a way forward or do you think it just has to kind of, I don't know, uh, collapse on itself? So when I was in my fight the man moment, um, I thought, well, I'm going to take this industry down single-handedly, right? I'm going to run naked on the battlefield. And I'm, I took out like, you know, a multi-million dollar insurance, life insurance policy, and I was ready to roll. And, uh, you know, I, I published these books, people have read the books and I have interacted, you know, in lectures, et cetera, with 
with people who have read the books and said, you know, thank you so much, Dr. Brogan, for, you know, your courage. I loved your, I loved your book is so helpful to me. Um, and then they go on to tell me that they, they went on to take a medication anyway. Right. And they're like, oh yeah, I, but I just like, I hit this really hard moment and, and I, you know, I just ended up taking the Lexapro and I have like a plan on getting off it, but, and I remember how like humbling that was, this happens, has happened to me many times. And I remember how humbling it was when I first started to hear of people who went on to engage the system after knowing better, right? Because my thing had always been that Maya Angelou quote, like when you know better, you do better. Well, not true. When you know better, you do better when you're ready, right? So what is this readiness? It's this very like elusive um, dimension of the human journey and you can't coerce it. You can't even really inspire it. It's something intrinsic. It's something innate. And it's it's deeply, deeply personal. And that's when I realized, well, it's none of my business. <laughs> Actually, who takes what and when they choose to stop it, right? It's actually none of my business. And if I am living in a version of my own life where I cannot find okayness unless everybody else is doing what I think is right and good, or at least a large majority, then maybe I should look again at how I am defining my contingent happiness, you know, as a woman. And so that's when my activism really started to shift. And I stopped concerning myself with the anonymous victim, which to most activists is a, a very important avatar, right? It's like, you know, the child who might get vaccinated if, you know, their parents don't have the information in time, right? It, it's the woman who starts the post breakup, uh, you know, benzodiazepine because she can't sleep and, and you, you just picture her, you know, five years down the line in a wheelchair because of her complicated withdrawal, right? So the focus on the anonymous victim, honestly, as a mother also compromised my presence to my own children. And, um, my capacity to be present in my own life. And if I'm really honest, probably was an elaborate avoidance mechanism my, for dealing with my own stuff and my own internal um, you know, shadow realms that I projected onto whatever it is that I deemed was bad on the outside, right? So how can I be so sure that it is wrong and bad for somebody to take a medication. I can't be so sure. I can only know what is, you know, aligned with my um, internal metrics. How can I be coherent inside of myself? That's literally all I can know. And I can't even know for my own partner. I can't even know, you know, let alone for, for somebody out there somewhere who ends up being an epidemiologic statistic, right? And we know epidemiology is not science anyway. So like, what are we even really talking about? So I stopped concerning myself with, with ever escalating rates of antidepressants. I understand, right? It's like, if you give birth in a hospital, you're already in the trauma field of medical rape, right? So dissociating through an epidural, well, I don't know, that makes sense, right? So it's like the context is sick, right? The, our, our, our social priorities, our, relationship to nature, like there is so much, um, misalignment that could, why focus? It's almost an allopathic consciousness, right? To say like, oh, the problem is the meds, right? Well, no, the problem is the terrain of the human experience. Right. And so that's why I'm actually really delighted, you know, to witness, um, that there seems to be a zeitgeist around, you know, trauma awareness. Um, and it has a shadow too, right? Cause like trauma obsession leads to like, you know, every virtue signaling and everybody has to be careful about everybody's traumas and microaggressions. And that's what I'm talking about. Like when I scroll social media, I find that people are very aware of how to feel feelings, how to take responsibility for their choices, that there are 20 somethings, you know, talking about these things that are, have taken me decades to learn in my own life boundaries, right. Um, really 
asserting and expressing my needs with kindness and, you know, relatedness. These are things that I imagine parents are now modeling for their children, that parents are now raising children, understanding that their emotional experience as the mother, let's say, is their responsibility, right? Understanding that their children are sovereign beings having their own experience. And the best thing they can do is honor their children's having their own experience, including their own emotions and take care of their damn selves, right? Like there, there is an understanding that is growing in the emotional realm and in trauma awareness realm. And this will translate to a different relationship to adversity. This will translate to increased neurophysical capacity to hold difficult emotional states, which are just sensations in the body, right? Um, this will translate to a different um, application of shame for social control, right? So that if there is a huge permission field for us to be, you know, weird and, you know, different and have feelings and um, express them, that is a very different world than one that splits into black and white, you know, the good girl, bad girl, and it's really clearly delineated, right? So all of my, you know, so-called bad girl gets put into my shadow. And then when I bump up against, you know, um, identity threatening experiences and emotions in my life, well, I need to suppress those. So I take the med, right? So, so I feel like there is a dissolving, um, and a deconstructing of some of the underlying sources of fragmentation and trauma that are driving the um, pathologies and the ever growing and ballooning like DSM five categories of what's wrong with us. So that's how you um, shift things from the inside out. I don't think it is actually, um, you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about, as I know you are about parenting, right? Like, how do we get this right? Like, how do we not pass on um, the, the conditional uh, love that we were raised with. Right. And this understanding that, you know, stop crying, calm down kind of relationship to our own feeling states. Right. Um, so I think if we just focus on how do we get those numbers down, how do we get people aware of how dangerous meds are? Um, I mean, I, I did that and I, I don't know that that's the way, like wh what I find is that the women, you know, I work with now, it's like not even really relevant to think about, you know, taking, a pharmaceutical. It's not that they're like crusading against it. It's just like, it's, it doesn't make sense because we're, we're interested in our own feelings, right? We're interested in our own narratives. We're interested in the spiritual significance of adversity, right? We're curious, right? We've, we've, we've reclaimed curiosity and that normalized shifts and changes the fabric of, you know, um, the medical industrial complexes claim on, you know, any average human, because I think that was at some point, one of the goals. I mean, there's nobody who's, I like to joke, like there's nobody who's safe from the blob of psychiatry. I mean, it literally who, who doesn't fall into that book, that big book, right. Of, of pathologies. I mean, we, we pretty much all do or could, right. So that's an incredible, um, enterprise. What a business model, right? And I think that it is being disrupted and in a very um, unexpected way. So I do feel excited about what is happening when it comes to, uh, I mean, I see to my kids, like what when it comes to normalizing um, emotional maturity and security and intelligence, which will be the foundation for resiliency around whatever emerges cognitively, behaviorally, however we handle um, distress, however we encounter these moments in our lives where we meet a part of ourselves that we didn't, didn't, you know, sort of like bank on interacting with at any point in our lives. I mean, you're, you are so amazing with words. <laughs> when I listen to you, it's like, it's hypnotic. <laughs> I love it. The with, um, I, I love what you said about, it's basically the, the taking of the pharmaceuticals is a symptom, isn't it? And it's, you're not addressing it, it, what the, the, the huge elephant in the room. But now you do. This is what you 
have these amazing programs that are able to actually help people get to the bottom of what's going on for them. And I wondered if you could talk about um, the Vital Mind Reset for the um, viewers. Essentially, um, you know, what I did to put my Hashimoto's into remission, I mentioned I then began to apply nutritionally, right? So it's essentially like an ancestral diet, right? I applied that uh, nutritionally to my patients. And then at the time, um, around that time, I was also trained in Kundalini yoga and became familiar with the kinds of meditations in this practice in this ancient practice that are actually called medical meditations, right? So they, they have a very specific intention. And what I liked about them is that they all, you know, you can have an effect in three minutes, three. So, you know, you're not asking somebody to sit down and meditate for 20 minutes or follow their breath or do like a, you know, a box breath for 20 minutes. No, it's literally three minutes. So I combined, you know, the, um, this specific diet, with the medical meditations, specific ones. And then I worked with my mentor, uh, Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez, who if you don't know who he, if anybody doesn't know who he was, I believe he's one of the most important figures in modern medicine. And I had the great honor of being mentored by him the last year of his life. And he uh, is a holistic cancer doctor. However, he, um, worked with all sorts of neurodegenerative and chronic illnesses and through a nutritional protocol based on his understanding through his own mentors, uh, like William Kelly of the autonomic nervous system. He had results that have never been matched in, you know, the published literature and posthumously we, you know, he, we collaborated, um, Mary Beth, his, um, widow, I guess she would be called, and other um, devotees collaborated uh, in publishing, you know, these, some of these cases, 125 of these cases. And, you know, he had outcomes like, you know, 34 year stage four pancreatic cancer survivors. I mean, long, long term outcomes. And his approach was predicated on lifestyle, right? So uh, when I uh, worked with him, I learned about a detox method called now everybody knows about it, but at the time it wasn't as um, notorious called the coffee enema. And so I learned a specific way to do it through him and combined these factors with his anointing of my program and evaluating it. Uh, and what I think he really infused the program with was way more than the coffee enema. It is the radical and committed belief that anyone can heal. And that is not just like some hallmark card, you know, like, yeah, anyone can heal. Of course, you know, if you want to No, <laughs> we have between us the proof and I believe in outcomes. I believe in proof. And that's why, you know, I dedicated a team of volunteers to publishing in peer reviewed medical literature. And, you know, I published an IRB approved randomized placebo controlled trial of this program. I believe that, you know, outcomes matter and, well, at least they matter to me. And so I needed to align myself with a mentor who had those outcomes and who could, who could really diffuse in me any doubt. Right. And so that is the first two weeks of my program are, are literally brainwashing. It's like me brainwashing you about <laughs> like, you know, what I believe is the truth of the wisdom of the human body and um, specifically why, you know, this is a fascinating thing that has, you know, really um, befallen you, your illness, your symptoms, and how they um, are inviting the answer to an existential question that only you can answer. Like, this is deep terrain, like how amazing that we're here. And you are going to get that answer. You just have to get quiet first. And how you get quiet is to focus a very uncomfortable amount of your attention on self-care, on what I call the chopping wood and carrying water of your lifestyle choices every single day. And what I found is that in the space of one month, that when you focus on yourself and you actually give enough of a shit about yourself, like, honestly, like, it's like you show up for yourself, like you actually care and you're going to prioritize yourself 
and every little thing that you've been told and conditioned to believe doesn't matter. Every little choice you make all day long matters, but we're just going to focus on, you know, your lifestyle choices every day, what time you go to bed, what kind of water you're drinking, what you're eating, you know, how you're starting your day and what you're doing to mitigate that body burden of toxicity, right? That's going to be our focus for one month. This isn't a side gig. This is a month that you engage one time in your adult life. And now, you know, I have my well friends who are like yoga teachers eating healthy, you know, they, they've done my program and it's been life transforming for them. So that has also expanded my understanding of like what's possible when you just do this ritual, right? When you um, initiate this dimension of what I now call, you know, your masculine that says, oh, I'm here. I'm here. I've got you. Like, what are we up to now? Right. I'm going to, I'm going to commit. I'm going to choose. I'm going to show up with discipline. I'm going to follow through. I'm going to have integrity of word. And at the end of this month, what is conferred is a reclamation of choice and the power of your choice. And I think what happens is that when you understand your choices matter, your whole system begins to shift out of the stress response physiology and into regeneration. When you have choices, it's cool, right? Like you don't need to be in fight, flight, freeze, fawn, because you only have choices when you are empowered, when you are no longer dependent, when you are no longer helpless. And so I think that is part of the real magic, you know, like the so-called miracles that have come out of this program is the simplicity of really um, showing up for yourself in this way and investing in yourself. So we've really gone down to a, a science over the years, like how much this program needs to cost, right? Like how many days and what kind of support um, need, needs to be offered. And so that's, you know, we open it up two times a year. It is the kind of thing you can do on your own. I actually would probably be the kind of person to do it on my own, but most people who have um, the extraordinary benefits really benefit from, of course, you know, you get it because um, you're this for me, you know, like it's being in the company of people who share, you know, your mindset and normalize that. It also confers a sense of belonging. So we have like group um, support in this too. And um are yeah so we're opening the doors uh, we're starting actually october 2nd for for this for this year oh, that's so exciting i didn't realize it was so soon that's great <laughs> the um i think what i get too from this uh from what you're saying is it it reduces fear which i think is primary to health would that be right Yes, that's what my mentor did for me. Um, and that is what I believe I translate, right? Like, and again, why I say some of the energy that I hold in this realm of my work is that it, it is like fatherly energy, right? Like when you have a good dad, your dad offers you safety, right? He offers you a sense of safety. Um, when you have a good mom, she offers you a sense of being loved, Right. So, so how do we, how do we, we reorient around safety, right? Like finding that safety. Well, we sometimes need a container within which to access that, right. Access that structuring, access that, um, that promise of okayness. And that's why I've been really passionate about like making sure my outcomes are very publicly available because, uh, when you know it's possible, you know, you can begin to orient towards your desires, right? Not just your fights, right? So you can say like, I hate this illness. I don't want to be sick anymore. I don't want to have pain. I don't want to take meds. I don't want to deal with insomnia. I don't want to deal with, you know, uh, fatigue and bloating. I don't want any of this. It's just a big no. And, you know, that's real. There's a part of you that is feeling that. And when you can begin to orient towards, oh, but this is actually what I want to feel, right? Like I, when you watch a video, you know, of, of Leanne who resolved her, you know, de destabilizing back pain, right? And you, you see her, her radiant, sweet energy, you get a sense for her relationship to her day-to-day -day life that feels light and it feels um, playful and adventurous. And 
you want that too, right? You want to make contact with that vitality that you know is your birthright. Orienting, you know, to the yes, right? To the I want that um, is so much more possible when you know what's what's out there, right? For you to, to choose from and feel inspired by. So yeah, that's that's a big part of why, um, you know, we we are growing this field and it, it is disruptive, right? So this is my favorite type of activism these days is to um, create the conditions for people to shed their victim stories, as I call it, right? Shed their struggle. And, and, and again, that could be, be your relationships, your relationship to finances, your relationship to, you know, your family of origin, where you live, you know, it, these, these patterns of struggle manifest in, in different ways for each of us, but the stories are so similar. It's almost always like a poor me, I hate this kind of a story. And the pattern disrupt that is necessary to shift out of that story, it has to be dramatic. It has to be big. And again, that's also why I'm a believer in the investment, right? It's not going to come for free, right? You have to orient your energy and your sense of um, importance and seriousness in a very ritualized way. And at the end of that initiation will come, it's like almost the freedom to ski new tracks down a snowy slope, right? It's like the, the new snow will, will, um, will fall on the mountain and you get to ski whatever tracks you want. And for some of us, that's like really overwhelming. Like, I don't, okay, I'd rather stick with the devil I know kind of a thing. And that's cool too. But when you are interested and ready for a new story, right? I do think this is one of the most powerful um, protocols out there for that. Yeah, well, I think it's, this is an investment <laughs> in your in yourself, isn't it? And it's, you can't, um, skimp on these things. I think we often, like you, you said earlier, we take ourselves um, sort of last on the bottom of the rank. And and if you really want to change, you have to <laughs> you have to take that step in and um, and and really invest in it in, in every way. Um, I'll pop um, the links for people to find um, the Vital Mind Reset, uh, the best place to find. But also. Kelly, where can people follow you? Because you do such amazing podcasts and other work. Uh, where, where, where can people um, find you? Mm. Well, I was saying that you're one of the only people that I follow <laughs> religiously. Um, and I know that it's like the censorship shuffle, right? That we are um, we are playing with. But uh, I, yeah, I did actually start a podcast, like a mainstream Apple and Spotify podcast uh, in January called Reclamation Radio. And I've been, it's the, it's the least censorship I've encountered, period. Like, it's very strange. And I almost feel like, wow, maybe I shouldn't jinx it. But uh, it's been, I've felt very, um, you know, free to express my Self. And I can't remember if I posted our interview yet, but anyway, it'll be up there eventually. So, you know, and Tom Cowan's on there. Like, it's just like, I, you know, I get to say the things. And I mostly am talking about what interests me a lot these days, which is um, a reframe of feminism and feminine embodiment and man woman relating. And uh, it's funny, you should talk about investment because I've really come to see, like, wow, like Vital Mind Reset and investing in that or like investing in the mentors and, coaches and, uh, you know, self-betterment stuff that I've invested in over the years. I was like, oh, that's like a, that's a very masculine investment, right? It's like, you're showing up, you're saying like, I'm here now, I've got this, right? I'm, I'm taking the wheel of my damn life, okay? Whereas like, you know, I have a in-person event in Miami uh, called Audacious Embodiment I'm putting on in November. And that's like a very feminine investment because it's really just for, for me, actually, as an entrepreneur, you know, funding that um, and for the women who come, because it's really just to play like, you know, there's we're like dancing and singing and exploring. And it's really just to it's like play money. Right. And, I, and those different flavors of investment, I think. Um, right. Whether you're you're buying gifts for yourself or you're paying your rent. Right. Like those are very different uh, energies. And I think we're coming to understand that it all matters and, and means something. So anyway, yeah, I, I have that podcast and then, um, yeah, then otherwise everything is, 
is probably just uh, on my site. I used to be like, first, you would appreciate this, right? Like first page results, organic search on Google for psychoneuroimmunology and gut brain and mood birth control. And in 2018, 19, with the algorithmic shift with uh, Google search, like you actually have to go directly to my website. <laughs> There's like no way to find me um, otherwise. So I guess you got to remember my my name, and my website in order to access that, uh, that info. So yeah, it's, it's been a trip. So the, your website, just so I know, it's... No, Kelly, it's um, kellybroganmd.com. kellybroganmd.com. That's important because I want people to find you <laughs> and to check things out. But um, And is there anywhere else, Kelly, are you on Instagram or um, any other uh, social media that um, people can find you? Yeah, so I was deplatformed off of... Um, Facebook, which is funny because I never really liked Facebook. So even though I had like a quarter million <laughs> followers, unpaid followers, you know, like I was like, okay, whatever. And um, I am shadow banned on Instagram, but I am still there. Um, mm. And I am, I have like a new TikTok page. And it's funny because I was really, really against TikTok. Like I uh, made a big deal with my kids about it and, you know, really saw it as being like a source of a lot of, um, darkness. And now it is one of my favorite places. <laughs> Do I have like <laughs> five people following me on there. So it's not like, you know, for my own business, but it's interesting, right? Like the light side of these algorithms because, and, and AI, because I, I go on to that app and I feel better in five minutes about humanity. Like actually I laugh. I'm so inspired by how creative people are, like especially these younger generations, because I'm like probably too old for TikTok, actually. And it's dissonant, right? Because I want to say it's all bad. Um, they're programming and brainwashing. And that's not actually my lived experience, right? So I was off my smartphone for two and a half years. And it really allowed me a reframe to now when I relate to this device, like, I actually enjoy it and I appreciate it. And it's not to say that I don't, you know, consider the, the tracking and, you know, all of it, but um, I don't feel that, that sense of like submissive um, rebellion, like rebellion. I, I used to feel like, like it's bitch, you know, like it was just a totally different relationship that I had. And it was addiction probably like just a frank addiction at the time when I decided to go off it, which was in, in 2020. Um, so yeah, I am, I am there too. And, um, yeah, I think, I think that pretty, on YouTube, I'm still there. Like it was weird. I don't know. Facebook was like, a, they made a, cause of the disinformation doesn't thing. Like they made a, uh, an example of me and some others, uh, at the time. So yeah, I'm still. It's a banding banding honor. Honor. And I love it that you're, <laughs> that I can say I'm friends with someone. <laughs> It's awesome. In my in my, my greatest book. credential, right? My greatest credential. Yeah. Oh, Kelly, thank you so much. It's been awesome to uh, just to hear. I think your journey as well. And I know you've said the story many times, but it's for me. I think it's it's really interesting hearing it. And you're an inspiration to myself and to so many. And I think um, it's. I really would encourage people to come and follow your work and have a look at Vital Mind Reset. And yeah. Amazing, Sam. I'm, I'm just so appreciative of you and, and our alliance. And uh, yeah, I just really think it's one of the many gifts, right, of these years is making contact with, with you and really um, in, in many ways. Uh, I don't want to say like passing the torch. That's not the right phrase, but it's, it's something like the feeling that I have when I interact with um, your and your husband's work is like, I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> like, it's like, <laughs> so grateful. And you do it so much better, right? Like, it's so, I mean, why you're not on that damn list? I have no idea, but like, you know, it's, it's, it's just, a, it's so wonderful. Like this, um, this quilt that we're weaving, uh, you know, through our own and through our own interests and exploration and the energy that you bring to the um, exposing of truth, I've always loved, right? Because I think that is, that's also part of the, the art form here is like, you know, when you're 
a gorgeous, radiant, humble, sweet woman, and you're, you're dropping the truth bombs that you are, it's just, you know, it's so much more fun. And then if you come at it, you know, like all angry and bitter and you look unwell and, you know, that's not, um, that's probably not how we, we model the attractiveness of the truth path. <laughs> so no, I, I appreciate I, I think it's the it's same. Thank you, Kelly. You're, you're like, you're, I think it's the same for you. You're, you're gorgeous. You're intelligent. And I think so well spoken to, and that it's just, I feel like, uh, I mean, we came into the game late and that was because of COVID, but I'm grateful for it. And I feel like we're standing on the shoulders of people that have done such amazing work and in lots of areas. Like I, I think, I mean, obviously uh, my channel was focused on germ theory. <laughs> like I didn't intend it to be like that, but that's what it's become. But I think, like you said, I think the that's a really important, that basically, what what do you call it? Big psych, big the mental health game is like, it's just as big, if not bigger. It's the same and, story, right? It's yeah. the same story again and again and again. That's why I could, I saw the germ theory thing, you know, whenever I did um, years ago, I just saw it's the same story, you know, it's the same exact story as in all of these other arenas where, you know, that, that invisible villain you know that like unsolvable problem outside of yourself um yeah trust us take these kind of a thing well thank you kelly you are a superstar legend in my book and um yeah well uh, i can't wait till we can have more maybe some more chats about <laughs> what's coming up so that's cool <laughs> i love it thank you sam if you enjoyed this video, please visit supportdrsam.com 